I have something really cool to share with you. I stumbled upon these weird small form factor 40 millimeter AIO liquid coolers by Dynatron, which are purpose built for one use server chassis cooling. And while they may have been built for a specific purpose, I think they have some potential to be used in unique ways, especially for liquid cooling small form factor gaming PCs. So let's get right to opening these packages and seeing what's inside. First we have the Dynatron L3, which is going to be the smaller of the two coolers that we'll be looking at today. The packaging is adequate and boring and also impossible to open. There we go. That's because this is really aimed at commercial customers. So basically you just get your closed cell foam. This is all your mounting hardware in a little baggie here. And then you have the actual cooler itself. Now, just a quick note, guys, if you're sitting there watching me unbox these and you're curious about these weird coolers, I did buy both of these from eBay and there will be affiliate links down below in case any of you wanted to get your hands on one. There were a few different sellers for these, so prices may vary. However, I paid around $100 for the L3 and roughly about the same for the L25-1. Just be careful. There are two versions of these coolers. Uh, there's one version where the fans will spin up to 15,000 RPM. This is the 12,000 RPM version, so hopefully these fans won't be too loud but I guess we'll find out in testing soon. So that's it, not much to unbox, but uh, let's move on to the Dynatron L25-1. This one, you may be wondering, where's the actual box? Well, the way that this one was sent to me was in a Lee and Lee case box, basically, like a gaming case box. It's kind of a waste of shipping space, if you ask me, but it arrived okay. That probably has something to do with these being like very much for OEMs and commercial clients. We have the exact same, as far as I can tell, Vegia hardware, and then the L25-1 itself. My first thought about these coolers so far is that this one is a five fan version and this one is a three fan version of the same thing. I'm a little concerned about how tiny these radiators are and how hard these little 40 millimeter fans are gonna have to try to remove heat from our test setup. And just before we begin testing, let's take a moment to hit the like button. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, let's take a moment to appreciate the design concept behind these unique coolers. Originally intended for one U server chassis cooling, they offer a very compact and industrial design. We have these crazy high RPM 40 millimeter fans, which are mounted on these rubber isolator pegs. That'll help absorb vibrations when these bad boys are flying around at their rated 12,000 RPM. These fans are so high powered, in fact, that we actually have to be careful about how we plug them into the motherboard. Dynatron does make it clear in their installation manual that these fans are high powered and are not to be daisy chained or Y split off a single header on a motherboard due to the amount of amperage that they can pull. We also see a pump mounted to the end of each of these units here. And what caught my eye about these coolers originally is just their weird form factor and their flat compact nature. These are just such a fork from the mainstream AAOs that we're used to. And then naturally, I got curious about what a three fan model would cool versus a five fan model. So now that we have a decent grasp on these coolers and uh, kind of a little introduction in what they're about, I think it's time to install them. So to compare the cooling performance, we have a basic test setup here. Basically, this is the 13600KF Asus Z690M Prime motherboard, 16 gigabytes of DDR4 memory, and just a GTX 960 for some video out because the KF CPU does not have onboard graphics. For some basis of comparison, we ran our tests with Noctua's L9i, representing a super popular, high performance, low profile air cooler, as well as Noctua's D15 flagship air cooler to give an idea of how the different tests with the Dynatron coolers could stack up against a few different types of cooling solutions. And unfortunately, because I'm using this old Lee and Lee test bench from the dawn of time, the CPU cooler bracket doesn't really line up with the cutout here, so I will have to actually uninstall this motherboard to change the cooler. We are also using a contact frame. This one's by Thermalrite, just to make sure the CPU is nice and flat to give it the best chance of making good contact with the coolers. So now that we got that CPU cleaned up, it's time to go ahead and start with the L3 cooler. And I say let's start with the L3 cooler first because you're probably going to start with the one that's not going to perform as good and work your way up, right? Now installation for these coolers is pretty much as you'd expect. There's no included instructions in the packaging for these coolers, but there is a nice full colored guide on Dynatron's site that you can download. And to make it easy for you, if you did want to have a look at that, I'll also have that linked in the video description below. I don't know exactly which way 
We want to mount this for this. Perfect, so we can go ahead and get this board back on our test bench here. Now I plan to power these high powered fans is to actually use this dedicated Silverstone splitter up here. This splitter uses its own dedicated power directly from the power supply. And then it just has an RPM signal, which is this wire here, which we can use to control all the fans together using the motherboard's fan control. Just need to find a place for this to sit because also keep in mind that the pump is on the radiator. So we don't want this to be the highest part of the loop. I think we need to put the graphics card back in here before we do much of anything else. And it didn't say anything about the pump being super high powered. So I think we're gonna plug the pump into the normal AIO pump port on the board. Okay, so I have everything set up. I need to test this cooler. Yeah, this is super janky. It's just kind of hanging out here. That's fine. I have my numbers here from my L9i and my Noctua D15. So uh, I'm gonna run through these tests quickly. But first, uh, let's see how noisy this thing is on boot. A little noisy when you first fired it up. Let's see, how fast are these spinning right now? And if this reading's correct, these are currently spinning at 4,000 RPM. The CPU is idling at 33 Celsius, just booting into Windows. So now I'm gonna quickly just run Asus's Fan Expert uh, fan tuning thing, just so I can get the minimum and the max RPM for these fans. So that's full speed. <laughs> that's loud. You would never run that ever uh, under normal circumstances. Okay, I got the fan tuning done. It looks like only the one port on this Silverstone fan hub actually reports RPM of the fan. And that's gonna be this port right here with this kind of like box shape. So because I didn't have a fan plugged into that port originally, it read zero RPM. Um, but I do have the fan auto tuning done in Fan Expert now. Looks like the lowest RPM these will spin is about 2600, 2700 RPM, and they are completely inaudible. I can hear my 3D printer in the other room over this. So now I'm gonna turn up the fan speed a little bit until I think I can hear it. Okay, now we're in the actual computer here, and what I've done is I've locked these 340 mil fans at 3800 RPM. I chose that number just because I can't I can't really hear them at that RPM, but I'd be curious to know if at that low of an RPM, can they keep the CPU cool under a quick Cinebench run? So I was gonna do Cinebench R23, but let's actually do R15, cause that's gonna be a little easier. So let's go R15 and see what our temps are with the fans locked at a reasonably quiet 3800 RPM. And that's interesting. So. The max we hit was 81, and partially that's just because this loop didn't have enough time to actually heat up. So if you were to run a longer workload where you're really slamming the CPU and having these radiator fans at a really slow RPM, it's possible you'll saturate the liquid pretty quickly and then you'll start thermal throttling. But if you're just gonna have small spiky workloads, interesting to know that you can have an AIO that's this small that just kept the CPU at 81C on a quick Cinebench run. Let's go hit Cinebench R23 real quick. CPU is just at default settings. Asus might have some sort of unlock power target thing on this, but it is the stock frequency and all that. So we'll get into a little bit of overclocking stuff later, but for now it's just the motherboard's defaults, whatever they are. And we're just trying to see if the fans are locked at 3800 RPM, which is very quiet audibly, you can barely hear it. If it can handle a quick spiky workload, 100% all cores like Cinebench R23. So let's hit this now. All cores are pinned at 100%. And max we've seen so far is 88C. So it's keeping it from thermal throttling. Don't know how long you could run this for without it thermal throttling, but with the fans locked at that lower RPM, you can get full speed for short, short bursty workloads like this. So I'm max at 92 there. So now what I think I'm gonna do is I'm going to set this to run for 10 minutes and I'm gonna see how long it takes to saturate this loop. All right, Let's see how long this takes to thermal throttle. 
We have hit 100C, but I have not seen it drop any clocks yet. Okay, we're starting to drop clocks now. So we're in for about 60 seconds, right around a minute mark before we started seeing it drop some clock speed. So that's interesting. Just gonna crank the fan speed up on this thing to cool it down. Okay, so I'm done kind of just messing around with the cooler now. I'm gonna get into my actual testing to compare it to the D15 and the L9i. So for this test, I think in order for this to be somewhat reasonable and not just brute force its way up the charts here, I've locked the fan speed at 5,400 RPM. And I've chose 5,400 RPM because that's a speed where, yes, it is audible, but you could totally work beside this. It sounds almost like an office hum. It's not annoying at all. It's, in my opinion, of course, this is subjective, but it's totally fine to sit beside. You could also, if you wanted to do a fan curve, these high RPM 40 millimeter fans, you could just have it set so that the max that they can spin at is that 5400 and they could spin slower if the CPU doesn't need the cooling. So for these tests, I'm just gonna lock them at 5400 and I'm gonna run through the suites and we will go from there. Okay, so we have some numbers in our testing done for the L3. So now I'm gonna go ahead and switch over to the L25-1. Forgot that it was called there for a second. Okay, now the bigger brother. Okay, L25-1, first boot. I have it carelessly balanced to try to keep the pump at the lowest uh, point here. So I have this one now tuned to the same roughly 5400 RPM. I can't get it exactly 5400 in this configuration. This one wants to spin at about 5200 RPM. So I will be right back after I run these tests. So with testing all done, I think it's time we draw some conclusions about these low profile AIOs from Dynatron. So first up, the Noctua L9i, it does throttle at the ASUS default settings. So we're seeing 100C at stock ASUS default settings. That means it's not possible to get any sort of OC out of our 13600KF on the L9i. So next up was the Noctua NHD15, which basically represented our best case scenario today at stock ASUS default settings for the 13600KF. The hottest temperature we saw on any core was 79C. And when we were running our overclock, the hottest that we saw was 85C. And that was after 10 minutes of running Cinebench R23 in a loop. So that was really like a stress test. You're not gonna see it go over 85C. Next up was the Dynatron L3 of the two unique AIOs we tested today. And remember, we locked the fan speeds on this to be like a comfortable audible level. This is not the most scientific test, but it was just trying to get a feel for how these coolers perform and what sort of small form factor type situations we might be able to use them in. So basically with the fan speeds locked at a comfortable noise level, it did outperform the L9i, and that's probably just because it's an AIO and it's gonna have the ability to soak a little bit of heat before it actually starts to thermal throttle. AIOs tend to work as a bit of a heat sponge in a way. It could sustain the full system load at stock settings for about a minute before it would thermal throttle versus the L9i, which would just thermal throttle immediately as soon as you started the all-core test pretty much. So that was kind of cool. You definitely do get more cooling headroom from the L3. Now also of note, the L3 with the fan speed being locked at a comfortable audible level, couldn't finish the R23 multi-core overclocked run because as you increase temperature on the CPU, you lose stability. In a way, you need to end up running more core voltage to maintain the stability. So the same settings we ran in a 10 minute loop on the Noctua D15 that topped at 85 degrees Celsius and ran totally stable for that 10 minutes, only ran for a couple minutes on the L3 before reaching 92 degrees Celsius and then ended up crashing and blue screening. I even tried to bump the voltages up a tiny bit more to compensate, but obviously that's also gonna raise the heat. So ultimately we got a, a did not finish, a DNF for the L3 on the multi-core tests for overclocked. Moving on to the L25-1, we saw performance very similar actually to the L3 when the fan speeds were also locked at a comfortable audible level. 
We did have to lock these fan speeds slightly lower because there's five fans versus three, so this does produce more noise. But overall, the L25-1 did outperform the L3 a little bit, probably just thanks to its larger liquid volume, if I had to guess. One thing we did do with the L25-1 while running the tests, because we ran into the, all the same issues basically, we got a DNF result for the Cinemage R23 multi-core tests because the CPU core temperature ended up being too high and causing blue screens and stuff. So one thing I just tried doing for fun with this is I just ran the fans full speed, which ended up hitting about 12,300 RPM. I mean, this thing was just screaming. The cooling results were impressive, however, Drawing over 300 watts from the wall running our overclock in the Cinebench R23 tests, it was able to sustain the overclock and run about three or four minutes of the 10 minute test before the temperatures creeped up to the point where the overclock wasn't stable anymore. So it did a really good job of keeping the temperatures under 90 degrees C on our all core overclock for the 13600K. And it wasn't until it creeped over about 90 degrees Celsius after about four minutes that it ended up blue screening but I'm confident that if I had a little bit more time to dial in that overclock, I'm sure the L25-1 could keep the 13600K overclocked and cooled for a sustained period of time. But of course, then you're dealing with the fan noise just absolutely screaming away. But that's where something interesting comes up. So you wouldn't necessarily need to use these 40 millimeter fans on this, depending on the case and the application. You could use some other fan that has like really desirable characteristics like high static pressure, high airflow, mount it somewhere else and then actually have a, a plastic shroud or something made to flow the air through this rad. So there's definitely a few interesting applications that I want to try out in the future for these coolers. So I'm glad that I completed the testing today so I have kind of an idea of like where they stand. Okay, so in summary, I was quite pleasantly surprised with what we learned today about these Dynatron coolers. I was quite worried that we wouldn't be able to get adequate cooling performance from these 40 mil fans without them absolutely screaming away. But once we locked them at like a comfortable noise level, they actually did still perform pretty good on our overclock 13600K. So I definitely think I will be using these coolers at some point or another in the future to do some sort of unique cooling stuff in some sort of small form factor computer. Thank you all for watching this video. If you found it informative and enjoyed our exploration of these unique Dynatron coolers, please leave a like and subscribe to my channel for more videos like this. Also, don't forget to hit the notification bell to stay updated. If you have any questions or suggestions, feel free to leave a comment down below. Until next time, happy small form factor cooling.